Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. We want to let you know that we have once again been honored with a nomination for the Hockey Podcast of the Year via the Sports Podcasting Awards. And all you need to do to help us is go to OurKidsPlayHockey.com and click on the Vote Now button. It asks you a couple questions. You're in and you're out, and you have voted for us for Hockey Podcast of the Year. I want to thank you all for being a wonderful, wonderful audience and helping us get to this stature of hockey podcasting because we've done it as a family, as the hockey friends and families around the world. Thanks so much and enjoy this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. Hello, hockey friends and families around the world, and welcome to another edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Today is a special goalies edition, but even if your kid is not a goalie, this is going to be one you'll want to listen to as we are going to dive into goalie culture and give some incredible insight into how goalies fit on your team, both on and off the ice. So please listen to this, even if you're not a goalie. And seeing how Mike and I are not goalies, we've invited an expert in goalie coaching today with us. Uh, he's an expert of a person as well. Coach Mike Shelley is with us today. Mike is a level five coach with a gold certification in goalie coaching and has worked with a plethora of professional goaltending coaches throughout his career. He is currently the associate head coach and goaltending coach for the Potomac Patriots premier and elite junior teams. In addition to being the owner and founder of Patriot Goaltending, which, as he puts it, wants to put a smile behind every mask and much, much more. But that was a cool saying, and I wanted to say it. Mike is a former Division I athlete, a watch commander with a local Virginia law enforcement agency, and one hell of a person. Mike, welcome to Our Kids Play Hockey. Thanks for having me. No, thanks for being here. So uh, just so everybody knows, this, this episode was inspired by an email we got. We get lots of emails on this show. Um, and we've actually kind of been producing this one for a bit because we wanted to make sure that, A, we had a goaltending person on here because I don't want to talk out of my rear end with goaltending. Um, but it, it turns out it's a pretty serious issue in the hockey community. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the email that we received. And again, I always say the names have been removed to protect the innocent. Um, and then we're going to have a conversation over a goaltending culture. And I'm going to I'm going to tell everybody listening again. I've talked to, to Shell about this a little bit before the episode. And some of the things he told me, I was even surprised to hear. So it goes to show you that you're always going to uh, learn. So here's the email. Okay, again, we received this from uh, from a listener. I'd love to hear you guys do a show about hockey goalie culture. My son is a goalie, and it seems like every team always blames the goalie for losses. The head coach of his team last year in a tournament blamed him and his goalie partner for the reason that the team lost every game but one. He told this to another parent, which then told everyone. So then the kids also jumped on board with saying it. It also seems like teams around here are always replacing the goalies from other organizations instead of keeping the ones they had from the previous season. This does not seem right as they keep 98% of the players. Okay, so that's that's the email. Shelly, I'm going to throw it right to you. How prevalent is this, right? Because when I read this, I was like, oh, maybe that's a one-off, but maybe not. So for me, um, from where, where I'm coming from and what and my context and everything else, it, it really varies. Sometimes it's geographic based um, that where it can be more so. It, it, you know, it depends on how many goalies are in the area and who's available um, as to whether, you know, that can be easily done. I know some organizations, goaltending is extremely hard to find, so they're not going to push players off. Um, but if you get into, you know, the typical, you know, culture areas where you, you know, Western New York, Boston, places like that, where there's a lot of hockey players, it's a lot easier to move to a different person if you feel they're not there. Um, where I tend to see it more would probably be at the AAA level where you have kids that you brought up and they're not really helping the team. And then you're going into the next year, those kids are pushed down and then you get, some, you bring somebody else in. So you're not developing that kid as a goaltender. You're pretty much just swapping out. That said, you know, tell me another job that you have where if you screw up, a big red light goes on behind you. They're really easy to target. You know, you get a player who misses a pass or doesn't block a shot. They may come back to the bench and the coach may have seen it or somebody else may have seen it. But if a, a goalie doesn't, you know, misses the puck and then ends up not making that save, then all of a sudden, you know, there's the right red light going on and a big number up on the board. And it make, tends to make them an easier target. It's a great point, you know, and I think that every team I've ever worked on professionally and down the goalies always tell me hey, you know everybody always forgets about the goalies we're doing practice plans where's the goalie practice plan we're doing game preparation where's the goalie preparation right doing off ice it just it just seems like you can't get a break now here's the thing i actually don't expect that to change anytime soon um you know it's all, almost a, it's almost a little bit underdog syndrome in a lot of ways but here's the truth 
goaltending is the most important position on any team. We all know that. We always say they're the backbone. So my first question to you, um, and you, I'd love for you to tell that story you told me about Bruce Boudreaux yesterday, is, you know, from your point of view as a goaltending coach, how should goalies fit on the team? How can we do it better as coaches, as parents? And then, and then we can break it down into think, maybe the, some of the things that are done wrong. Because I got a story from yesterday that I got to share. So um, how they fit in, include them, just like anybody else. Like, you know, it doesn't matter where they are. So I, I run into a lot. Like, you know, you'll get a head coach and they're like, I don't, I don't know about goaltending. I don't want to talk. I just want them to go and make saves. And, and we don't say stop pucks. We say make saves. It, it, it's a whole bunch of things where negative mindset fits in and everything. So we always want to use they, they made the save or they didn't come up with the save but it's always a positive aspect of it. Goalies are mental creatures and a habit and everything else, but um, include them in what you're doing. So if you've got, you know, power skating, a lot of coaches will be like, okay, goalies, you go over with the assistant coach or go over there and do your goalie stuff. And then uh, the rest of the team does power skate. No, goalies got to skate. They have to be, and, and I say that they don't need to be Connor McDavid with speed, or, you know, but they have to be the most prolific skater on the ice. The edge control, the up and down, the lateral movement, everything is done uh, basically on the inside edge of their blade. You know, th they have to be the best skaters. And if you're, for, even from my young age to the pros, if you're telling them goalies do your thing and the rest of the team's going to go to the other thing, well, you're already separating them from the pack. So now it makes it really easy to push them off to the side and say, well, it's clearly their fault. They're not even really part of the team. They're just there. But you said it in the, in the, in the years, Ali, was play your game without a goalie. <laughs> and see what the score ends up as. Right. There was a team in New Jersey that one time they played a game with two goalies and they still got blown out. It was like 20 something to nothing because they were playing a team that was way above their level. And that was their way, coach's way of protesting it. But into the story you brought up about Bruce. So I'm not throwing Bruce under the bus. He's a, he's a phenomenal guy. I've got, I got to talk to him for quite a while. And I know a lot of players that um, have I've coached have actually gone to his camps and done stuff and everything else. His whole family's great. His son actually played for the Potomac Patriots where I coach. Um, so he, he was brought in to do a, uh, a talk to coaches basically. And one of the parents asked, you know, Hey, you know, how, or one of the coaches asked, how, how do you, uh, how do you, how do you deal with your goaltenders? I don't, I have a goalie coach. Well, how do you know if they're doing well, they're stopping the puck. So even at the highest level of the game, there's this belief that the goalies are the goalies. And then I, the coach does the rest of the team. And if that's your culture, then you don't have a team culture. You don't because you're automatically think of like, you know, you're, you're playing professional football and you're like, well, we have Tom Brady over here and then we have the rest of Tampa Bay over here. I'm, I thought that's just how they Tom do it in Brady. Tampa Bay. Is that, yeah. is it different down there? Is <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You know he, I'm teasing. He's I'm this teasing. guy that throws a football and, you know, whatever. right. But yeah, yeah. So, it, but you wouldn't do that in any other sport. So, but in hockey, it's like, well, the goalies are the goalies and the rest of the teams, the rest of the team, but we're all a team. It, that, that doesn't, that doesn't jive. Right. Yeah. It's, it's amazing to me, too, because most of the coaches I know were ex-goalies. <laughs> What's wrong with these guys? I said, you know, I, you know, I meet so many, you know, it's so, it's so funny because I don't, I don't even think sometimes goalies, ex-goalies understand how to incorporate the goalies into practice because they never were incorporated into practice. They're just like, I don't know, they're just at the end of it, I'm just required to do like the breakaway contest at the end of practice. And the rest of it, is like, I kind of mm -hmm. just follow the drills around. And I think... Um, I don't know. It's funny. I've always had a good relationship with my goaltenders from, from the start. I think I, I played a little goaltender for a while, you know, won a little couple of championships as like a 10 U multi goalie slash player. And I think, you know, I think, so I think having that perspective of like, Holy crap, this is hard. Like, like this is, you know, carrying around all this gear and the pressure of, um, you know, not, not, not so much parental pressure and, and to Lee's point, not, not even the team pressure, Put the pressure on yourself. If you're an athlete and you're a competitor, you know, you're going to have, you know, I, I mean, we see it in, in players, right? P players that are unsuccessful skaters are unsuccessful because they can't, you know, wash things away. They can't, they can't, they can't get past missing a check or missing a, a shot on net or, you know, in the goaltenders, I think that's what's so unique about goaltending when you find them early, right? Is that you, you can find a kid and a player that has a, has a stronger kind of mental fortitude to be able to say like, listen, I'm, I'm pretty good. And, and I'm trying, this is what I'm doing. And this is what I can control. And I think the more we teach our goaltenders and our coaches that we can, uh, you know, we, they can only control what you can control. And like, to your point, Mike, like you, 
you, you, I didn't see you raise your hand when the goaltending pass got handed out, you know? So I think it's, uh, you know, it's, I think it's just, just, we have to be conscious of, you know, what kids we put in a net and mm -hmm. exactly. I, I, I had a, I was at my, I was at a level five up in uh, a USA hockey program up in Lake Placid a couple of years ago. And Mike Richter and, and John Van Beesbrook were the two uh, guest speakers. Oh, you were that one. Yeah, yeah. I was there. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you so, guys have been in the same room before. Yeah. 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 So, so, and you know, and they made that point, right. These are not, goaltenders are not the weird the weirdos in the corner that need, need need to be shunned yes do they have different routines sometimes and maybe they want to warm up differently or listen to different music or, or focus differently before a game but the more the more you treat them like they're not part of the team the less part of the team they're going to be and you know talk and when you talk to two people like like that that have played play at obviously the highest levels of the game and now you know coach and instruct and, and advise at the highest levels you know, it, I think it really opened the eyes to those 500 coaches in the room to say, yeah, yeah. Why am I treating my goalies different? They're just, they're part of my 22 man roster and, and I need to incorporate them into everything we do. You know, there's so much to go into this episode, Mike, those are great points. I actually have notes here for you, Shelly. So I'm, I'm going to start, let's start with where Mike is, is going with, <laughs> with kind of just getting into goaltending. I want to tell the story. I was at my son's U8 game yesterday and I, I, I'm always thankful to go because it, it look, it, I, I've said this to everybody. I get anxiety at these games like every other parent, right? I just, I, because of this show mainly, I've, I've been able to kind of control it, right? And I remind myself, this is really not what this is about in terms of like being anxious. So I get calm and then I kind of start to listen. And we were playing a team yesterday that when we got there, we're, not, we're, we're on one of those mini rinks. So it's perfect size for U8. And this other team comes out, tackle twill jerseys. They look fantastic. I'm not, I'm not being sarcastic, right? And their goalie comes out with full pads, like they're his, right? This kid has the pads, all right? And I'm looking down. We have a kid in net who's maybe played goalie once with our, with our sublimated jerseys, which are fine. And uh, I'm like, oh, man, we're going to not do great today. Long story short, we won the game by quite a bit. What stood out to me, because I'm not bragging about the win, all right? Because I honestly don't care if you win at this level, all right? Was I'm listening to this goalie's parents probably trying to be encouraging, yelling at their kid in net about what to do on every save. And I'm like, this kid's not going to be a goalie long if this is the way they're going to do this, right? So here, this leads to the question. I, I was kind of taken aback by it. It's like, what, what are you doing? This, this, this kid and his, he looks like Mike Richter and all his pads. He's probably never played goalie before the season or maybe half a season. We're telling him, yeah, kick save, do this. Like he probably doesn't even know the fundamentals yet. So Coach Shelley, 8U, 10U, kids going, I want to be in net. The nightmare of every hockey parent that understands how much that costs. <laughs> what would you consider an appropriate process to introduce the position of goaltending to that age group? And then how would you know if, okay, I think my kid is a goalie? So obviously, go, USA Hockey tout line is no early specialization. Same thing for goaltenders. We want them, you know, if your kid, like, I want to be a goalie, because let's be honest, most kids get into goaltending for a couple of reasons. One, they're the youngest of all the kids in their family. <laughs> so they're the right. one that got thrown in the net. So big brother and big sister can whip balls and, and street hockey pucks at them and everything else. Someone's got to take it. Right. So they got the, the pillows <laughs> tied to their legs and they had to make saves and that's how they got into it. Or they really, really just watched a hockey game and they love the equipment and they want to put the equipment on 90%. So I did, I've done mini mites, mites all the way up through, you know, juniors and guys who are playing college now and everything. And they're um, once they put the real gear on, most of them don't want to do it anymore. One, because it's really boring, especially at the younger ages, because they're not getting a lot of shots. And two, the stuff weighs so much, even nowadays, not back when Mike strapped them on and there were horsehair pads and stuff like that. But, you know, they're, um, right. we, yeah, yeah. So the, the pads, like, not, like once you get over that, it's usually about a one to two times that they actually do it. And then they're, and then they don't as an organization. Um, and I'm not pitching anything over one other, over another one. But like Vaughn and, and, and Pure Hockey have like a quick release set where the, the pads just slide over the top of their of their regular shin guards and they have a padded shirt and the kids put them on, they wear their normal gloves. That's good for the early ages because those kids can experience that and see right. if there's really like any inclination to go towards being a goaltender. Um, 
they still need to skate out. Like I have two goalies that, you know, my son is an extremely high level goalie and Lee, you met him when you were down with us. I did. And then my daughter also plays and she plays on a girl's team uh, travel and she's another goalie. And so I, neither of them got to early specialize. They, they had to skate out. I wouldn't let them do it. And it was like, no, you're going to do this. And, and they, those kids that will gravitate to that if they're naturally, I, I say this, and this isn't anything against any other players. I think goalies are the smartest kids on the team because they have to understand math. They have to be patient. They have to understand the dynamic. Like, you know, Mike brought up as like a goaltender, they, as coaches, they see the ice differently. They've spent decades yeah, watching the game it developing in front of them. So when they make, they make a determination that I'm going to become a coach, it, it's they, they watch this game develop better than someone who sat up in the, in the Raptors, maybe doing media or something else. And they've experienced it because they know what it's going to take to, to score. And I, I, for me, like shooter wise, when I run my goalie camps, I want shooters to come out because they can realize, you know, this is what the goalie's being taught so that right. they can figure out how to break it down. Well, as a coach, you know, kind of an expectation. If you were a goaltender, what you would have done in that situation, you can relay that to your team. So going back to the younger kids is we don't want them to early specialize. We want them to experience everything. If they really, really want it, they're going to keep coming back for it. They're, they're, you're going to get that one or two kids who are just like my son. I'll use my son as an example. He played center. He played defense. He played wing. Didn't matter where he was on the ice. He always ended up in the crease. Right. It didn't so, matter what magnet. position he was playing. He was back in the crease. I'm like, why are we fighting this anymore? Just put the pad. <laughs> yeah. So my story, actually, when my son, we, we, we went through the quick change, uh, you know, years, right. And just everybody trying goaltender. And then, you know, I, I, you know, when I saw my son have a little bit of inclination about, you know, I like that. That's kind of cool. You know, look at the helmets they get to wear and, and they get to wear the cool pads. So, you know, my goal was to really actually get him as, as um, kind of unprotected as possible. And just hit him enough, like in the in the areas where it would, I don't know, it would hurt, but I don't think I'd hurt him. Like just a, a little enough pain where you want him to you, feel it. Yeah. yeah, just feel it and say, okay, this is not fun. You know, a, a puck to the ribs is not fun. So you know, if you're if you're an anti goalie parent like myself, just try to find you know, just try to find ways to uh, <laughs> the honesty know, get, is just get, pouring get, out of you. Get, <laughs> the, get those. It's too much pressure. It's too much pressure. My one of my guys plays lacrosse goalie, and I'm like, this is not right. It's it's just not a normal thing for somebody to want to do. So I think it's just, you know, it, but again, I think that, you know, Mike Shelley, your point is so well taken that, you know, there's so many opportunities to put so many kids right now through our, through the goaltending and through the crease at the earliest levels and to try to find, okay, what kids do gravitate towards it. Cause sometimes a kid gets thrown in the neck because the parents just like, Oh my God, he's a terrible skater. And, and he's a little overweight or he's lazy or, you know, you know, she doesn't like to, you know, she doesn't like the physical contact. So we'll put her in the net. And I'm like, no, no, that's the last person we want in the net. Like I want, I want the aggressive, you know, thoughtful, you know, cerebral, you know, competitor, you know, I want somebody that's going to, you know, just going to keep going for pucks no matter where they are. So I think it's, uh, it's, but, but I do think it's the opportunity we all have as coaches to get those kids into early, you know, situations to try and then to identify the kid that kind of wants to stick with it and gravitate towards it. You know, that's really fulfilling, right? Because as you know, and, and Lee, you'll see it in a couple of years. I mean, our system's not made to keep goaltenders in it. It's such a weird, it's like, you know, we, we get, we have a big bottom of the pyramid, but because we only keep two goaltenders on a team. And if that one goaltender doesn't materialize as a goaltender by 13 years old, all of a sudden you're everybody's sitting around going, Oh my God, there's no, like right now there's, there's no Oh seven goaltenders. It's like, it's like, it's, you know, you see like, like midget minor. I see emails and, 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 and posts everywhere for Oh seven and Oh eight goaltenders, because we've gotten to the point where, you know, they, they aged out of being able to get better. At, and they were maybe not the right person to be in the net. And all of a sudden now it exposed itself because they can't stop box. They're like, what the hell am I doing here? And going back to that email, doesn't help when you have people that are just you know not only inconsiderate but just don't understand you know that our job is to try to keep kids in a comfort level to be successful just like our officials right it, it's a it, an official and a goaltender probably have to go see the same psychologist because i think it's the it's the same it's the same pressure it's the same you know uh, you blew the game it's negative fault. it's yeah. the same yeah. you know negative uh, side of the game that we see that exposes itself the easiest and the most you know 
one of the directions I want to take this now, Mike, and you kind of open it up for this is like, let's talk about solutions or prospecting ways to change this. Because I think, Shelly, you're right. It's it's Some of this is cultural in the locker room. And it, it starts from the beginning. There's a stigma around goalie, like, okay, get the pads on, try it. So we find out you don't like it. It's probably not the right way to be introducing that position to a hockey team. Not to mention at the younger ages, they think it's like you said, it's awesome at first, right? So I don't think we're planting the seeds on a team enough from a, as you said, off ice team building environment and on ice team building environment, right? So I want to talk about that. How can we incorporate goaltenders more into the day to day? And let's go U8 up, right? I, you know, again, once you get to the higher levels, this changes pretty dramatically, right? But from your point of view, how should teams be running the day to day on you in youth hockey with goaltenders, right? What, 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 what are you seeing? We're not doing what can we do more of? Um, first thing, let's step back from the players and go to the coaches. So Please, I think yeah. we need to do a better job of training our coaches. Um, cause it's all going to, it all starts from there. Your team doesn't do anything. Your team doesn't have a plan. Your team doesn't touch the ice. It doesn't have pucks unless your coaches are trained. So I'm sure, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm probably not the only one who's ever heard this, but you have the one parent coach or whatever else who's come out with the team and they can't really skate. They can't really do much. So you, the, the coach is, doesn't want to deal with them. So he's like, hey, go take the goalies and just go shoot pucks. Out. <laughs> right. They, they don't know what they're doing. They don't have it, but they're there. They want to give, they want to help. So they're like, okay, cool. I'll just do what the coach says. So they take the kid and they're, they're throwing pucks at them and everything else. And by doing that, they're probably developing bad habits. Yes, the goalie is getting a little bit of, of training and everything else, but it's a, so for me, one of the aspects, you know, cause one of the many roles I have with Potomac cause I'm the travel lead is I've been working there for for well over a decade is um, to try and help my coaches understand how to be better goalie specific coaches, you know, and, and for them, it's like, okay, you know, we, these are certain things you can look for. These are things you can train. So I've done PowerPoint presentations and stuff with them, like, you know, proper leg recovery, you know, it's like if a goalie's person push in a certain direction, what leg do they stand up on? Right, Very right. simplistic things that can be taught to a coach that they can recognize and then it builds their confidence and it might build their interest to actually go out and, and develop their knowledge base even more. So um, full disclosure, I was not a goalie growing up. I played defense on hockey. Um, I became a goalie coach out of necessity. You know, it was like, there were none in my area basically um, where I'm at. So it was, I got to do some really cool things with it. And it was all because of the desire to make myself better and to make the people around the kids around me better and everything else. And now I've developed players that are, that are playing, you know, collegiate hockey at highest levels, played in world junior championships, all sorts of fun stuff. And it's literally from the coach continuing education, taking the first steps and then taking that information and relaying that to their players and then including them in it, just like we talked about before. Yes, the goalies should get a little bit of specialization because there's certain things like they need to be warmed up. You don't want to run right into 8,000 shots yeah. on a goaltender. Yeah. Can, especially... we, can, we, can, we, can we focus on that just for a second? Yeah, yeah. Because as, look, that's something that pisses me off as a coach, right? At every level is just a basic understanding of the you have to warm your goaltender up. Right. And, and, and this is one of the things I actually get stern on even you eight players with of like, this is not the time to show me you can lift the puck. I need you to hit the goalie in the pads. Right. Or even at the high levels, even in pro, you need to know where to shoot on the goalie, get them warm. Cause if they're not warm, we have a problem. So, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Could you, oh. could you just dive into that? Just warm ups in general for a quick second, maybe like quick so, tips of what to do. So one of the, I have a couple of drills that I, that I absolutely despise. Um, for multiple reasons, but one of them is like a three cone drill where they're like one low in the zone, one mid in the zone, one at the blue line. And it's just one, two, three shots. And the goalie right. has no chance to recover. Like right. they have no chance to recover whatsoever. Or if your first thing out of the, out of the gate is a uh, slot line plays, backdoor tip-ins, things like that, where the goalie's having to push across there. It's like 650 pounds of pressure every time they butterfly on their kneecaps and ankles. Like, so if, if you're jumping right into that, I mean, think about this, you haven't stretched, you haven't done anything and now go run a marathon, right? Like you haven't warmed up. You haven't done anything. That's basically what you're telling the goalie to do for the next hour. You are going to run a marathon. We're just going to keep pumping pucks at you and pumping pucks at you. One of the big things that, uh, for that you can do simple, if you're going to give your goalie separate time, put them on the goal line or wherever you have space, have them get down in their butterfly already. And one of the drills that I do is I just go, 
you know, they shoot the uh, coach or player, whoever your best shooter is, glove, chest, blocker, blocker, chest, glove. And they repeat that for about 12 or 15 pucks. It's really letting the goalie focus and feel and rebound control. It's, it's a simple drill. It takes less than two minutes to run through it. And they're, they're pretty well warmed up. And then for like my, when my out with my juniors, when we start with our flow drills right away and the guys are picking up pucks at the blue line and then walking and maybe shooting from the top of the circle, don't butterfly. I don't care if you get scored on. I don't care if the puck goes past you. We're not rating you on how many go in the back of the net at this point. It's you tracking the puck off of the, off the stick right. into your body and using your rebound control. And if they're flying up the other ice, just don't get hit in the back, but make focus on one puck at a time. So, and I, I probably have a little, I mean, from my perspective too, just from a programming perspective and team building. And, and I think just a lot of stuff that I do with time management with, with teams, I probably have a little different perspective because I start, I start all my practices off of the game. So we're playing like some kind of a small area, you know, across ice or, or zone game. So we really build into our goaltenders that they have, they can't be warmed up when they get on the ice at seven Oh five, they got to be warmed up at six forty. Yeah. Like that warm up has to, it doesn't have to be, I think what we have to get away from in, in the sport of ice hockey is this feeling that the only time you could be ready for practice is when you put your skates on and step on the ice. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, that would help soften the, yeah. you know, now, you know, I'm not working with 19 and 20 year olds either. I mean, there's no eight year old that's going to blow a hammy. They don't even have hammy strings yet. You know? So it's like, it's like, well, where, you know, what can we do? What can we do to engage the athlete quickly? But at the same time, understanding like Lee, you probably do this anyway, inherently, or just, you know, just because this is your background, but building a culture of warming up, like an eight year old doesn't need to warm up, but right. they need to warm up. They need to learn how to warm up. They learn, they need to mentally know that, right. okay, practice is seven, but it's really at six 30. And how I'm preparing to get on the ice is all part of how I practice. Like even now with the organizations I work with, I've yeah. gotten them to all be in the mode that you never list the time practice starts on the time you get on the ice. Time, the practice starts when practice starts. Right. So if your ice is seven to eight, your practice is probably 6.30 to 8.15 and cool down and warm up. And like we have, to, it's just a bad culture we have in, in hockey well, because, it, it, because like you don't see players yeah. Um, you know, and parents like they're like, oh, don't worry, he'll be there for practice at seven. No, well, practice yeah. starts at six thirty. Like the the fact that I have to spend fifteen minutes warming you up is 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 taking away from this valuable resource that we have. So we need to get we got to change the culture. But you're absolutely right. You can't just like I used to get crazy with my players, and it probably have, why I have a good relationship with my my goaltenders is like I never did rapid fire you know, drills. And if I saw, if I saw a player shoot a puck from the corner in the line, while well, there's a, a pucks coming at goalies, you know, from the top of the slot. And this kid just wants to start sniping corners because he's bored. You know, I would tell the goalie, you can do whatever the hell you want. You want to take a stick across his kneecaps, go ahead. But cause it's your, you know, your <laughs> stick's a lot. Michael Bonelli's school of goaltending. Well, the hell, I mean, cause you're, 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 these goaltenders are resources. You I'm need. with you. No, no, I'm I don't need, you. I don't need that six string defenseman. No, I'm, I need I'm Billy you. Smith. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Billy Smith. Hey, beat Billy Smith. If, you, if I get hit in the back of the head with a puck and I'm a goaltender, I'm losing my mind. Oh, yeah. I'm, so I'm just going to say, free. you could have said Ron Hextall there, but you didn't. Okay. I'm just going to say, <laughs> right. Uh, look, just real quick, making myself vulnerable. Mike, just to prove your point, you know, I, I, I think I've said this once before. I, I realized I was getting to the rink and rushing my son. Like, well, we got to get on the ice. And I realized this isn't my son's fault. This is mine. I need to get to the rink earlier. I need to wake up earlier. I need to get there half an hour ahead of the time I think I need to be there just from the mental aspect of it, of not having to rush. But, uh, and look, parents, I know not every practice, not every game that's possible. I get it. A lot of us have mo more than one kid, but that was kind of a mental awakening for me. Now for the goaltenders, um, let me ask you this, Shelly, right? Here's a, a tip I think that's important. Instead of just assuming what you think the goaltender needs, ask the goaltender what they want before the game or the practice. Is that something you would do it, it's going to be age specific on that for sure i mean i, I don't expect an eight-year-old um, to know but yes yeah exactly once you yeah. start getting to the 14 year old range they've probably already got something and they probably are like, if any any goalie who's worth his salt is going to have a routine already developed agreed sometimes yeah. the big thing is like the routine's way too long like <laughs> some <laughs> some guys will have like an hour and a half routine and it's like no you don't need that <laughs> and other goalies like you know even at the pro level like you know yeah I think that it was maybe Ben Thatcher Demko had an interview at one time where he was taught spent like an hour and a half warming up, and then all he does now is go play Sui 
That's it. And that, that's right. kind of what he does for his well, and I, I think I think yeah. that's the same thing, right, Mike, is to, is to communicate that to your head coach yeah. and communicate that, whether you're eight-year-olds or 18. Just say, listen, this is kind of my routine. Just so you're not screaming at me when you're having your team meeting five minutes before we get on the ice, that I'm still out there, you know, knocking balls off the wall. Just, just, this is where, this is what I need. So how do I incorporate what I need into right. your needs? <clears throat> and, you know, sometimes that's a parent having that conversation. Yeah. 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 yeah well, we, we talked about right, that a lot, Shelly, right? We talked about that in yeah, training camp quite a bit. Absolutely. Um, listen, I, I did interrupt when we were talking about culture. I do want to say this thing, and I want to dive back into that. Was uh, I just went on the USA Hockey mobile coaching app just to check. I wanted to see what was there. And there is a whole section for goaltenders from beginner up. So if you are that hockey dad or hockey mom that uh, Coach Shelly just referred to, there is a resource online for you to find those drills. And coaches, head coaches, um, one of the things I always appreciated at the U8 level, and, and remember, I've coached at high levels. I never coached U8 before really a couple years ago. So I didn't really know what to do. And I told the head coach, hey, I'm I'm new to this level. Like the, the, the information I have at the top levels is almost useless here. And what he would do is he would print me out or send me drills to do with the kids and hand them to me before every practice. And I really, really appreciated that. Okay, so if you're going to if you're going to have uh, uh, assistant coaches, volunteers and you need help on the ice. Go on the coaching app and print some things out and hand them to them on the ice. So at least they have some direction, right? And, and, and Shelly, we're, we're assuming here that USA Hockey has some good stuff. That, that's like a pretty good app. Um, and there's other resources too, coachthem.com, uh, Hockey Coach Vision. There's a lot of things. So anyway, I just wanted to say that because we try and give as many tips and trades as we can. But I want to throw it back to you. So all that talk was just about the warm-up. <laughs> we didn't even get into the game and off ice after the game. Let's get back into it. Goalie culture, what can we do? Or team culture, incorporating goalies, team. what can we do? Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, I guess it, it's, it's communication. It, it, right. um, Mike brought it up, too. It, it, there, there has to be, it, it, you know, you can't, the authoritarian coach is gone, or at least should be gone. Right. You know, um, for the most part, it should be, it should be an open, quasi-open door um, policy. You know, obviously the coach is still going to make the final decision, but you need to talk to them. You know, every player is different. Every, every goalie is different. Yeah, they all, they're, you know, they're all, we all want to make it saves and doing the best they can, but it, ultimately it's what one guy may need or one girl may need, another one may not. Right. Um, and it, it's really just bringing them into the fold and, you know, and, and if they screw up, you hold them accountable. Like if they, if not, you know, if you've got a team that can't play defense and they give up 70 shots on net and they give up eight goals, that's not your goalie's fault. Right. You, you got to either find a better coach or better defenseman. I mean, that's kind of what you need to do. Um, you know, if you're, if your team's only given up 15 shots and your goalie gives up six goals, you got a problem with a goaltender. You need to hold them accountable. <laughs> this is where the math comes um, in that you talked about. No, yeah, I'm just kidding. It, I'm kidding. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, it's not a, it's not a situation where it's like, well, they're the goalie. So we just have to put kid gloves on them. No, 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 no. That's not how this works. Like there are, there are times where the goalie has to make the save and any good goalie. I mean, you can watch at any level. They're going to get beat every once in a while, but they have to be able to steal a game for you. Right. There's going to be times when your team is down and they need that extra push. And the goalie's got to be the one that steps up and, and either seal, make sure that that doesn't end up in a loss or keeps you in that win, you know, or to, so it, uh, keep it from a tie. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, cause I want to tie this in too, just so, cause you're, you, you keep bringing up the points of, you know, all the, to, to, to what you're describing, right. Seems like it's all about, you know, preparation for the goaltender. So maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, what do you, what would you expect out of your goaltenders or what do you expect out of your goaltenders then about compete and practice? Like I hear it all the time. Like, Oh, I'm a, I'm a gamer. I'm a gamer. Like, and I, and I, and I, the goaltenders I love are the ones that they want to kill somebody in practice. If they give up two more, two or three goals in a game, like they like, and, and then finding, so I have a two part question. Number one is, you know, how do you build that competitiveness in a goaltender themselves? And then do you like, like, would you rather see, and this is how I advise the kids I work with. Like, I want to see a good goaltender be matched up with a good goaltender. Like, I don't want the starter and then the crappy kid who's never going to push this other kid. Like, if you get, if you're in a situation where, well, I'm the starter and then you're just kind of here to play when I get hurt uh, or I got to go to a birthday party, then I just don't think that builds any kind of anything for the, for the, for the quote unquote better goaltender. So there, I can go for hours, but um, <laughs> so. Here, so Basically, you're 100% correct. Um, I don't like the 
you, you know, our a our, our our we have a one and a two or whatever it may be. You have you should have on a on a team, and and yes, this is going to vary. If you've got you know U eights, U tens, or lower A, upper A, you know things like that. If you're talk if we're talking higher end, we're talking you know in my uh, juniors, college, triple A, those kind of things. You should never have a one two. You should have a one A and a one B. In other words, any day, one could be A and one can be B. If those kids are not there pushing each other, you did a bad job recruiting. All right? you, you did a bad job recruiting your players or, bring, or, or developing your players and bringing them in. So at the junior level, you know, we have my program, we have two teams. We have an elite team and we have a, uh, and we have a premier team. My expectation is we, we bring in six goaltenders, all right? three assigned to each team. It, those goalies there are to compete against. Yes, they want to work together. They're going to build their 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 own little group, their own little niche. But they are pushing each other every day because it's you know the decisions are made almost daily as to who's going to play based off of who did the best right. and who brings the best aspect to the team. And you know, there's lots of nuances at the higher level. That, like we'd be able to speak to is who when you're deciding which goal is playing. Well, it may be that yeah but this goalie here has a way better record against the team that we're playing against. So he's going to go or she's going to go versus the other goalie who technically may be a little bit more skilled, but they don't have the, they don't have their records that the other ones do. Yeah. Shelly, what I'll say is this, is it one of the things we do? And, th and this is, a, this builds stigmas by accident at the younger levels. Like w w people will look at an NHL team. Uh, well, let's use the Rangers 10 years ago. A Lundqvist is in that. And then there's the backup or Brodeur is in that. The, well, let, let, you know, there's a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> right. No. Yeah. It, it, you know what? His first backup was Kevin Weeks. Right. Yeah, he was a tremendous yeah. school attendant. Yeah. Right. And then there was a flurry of them throughout the years that went. Steve Aliquette. And he'll say Balaket. it. He'll say it. I knew I was the backup. Like, well, like, it, so so that's, and then, a, that's a, a same, thing yeah. same thing with Brodor. Same thing with Brodor. I'm going to I'm building towards this thing here. Brodor played, I think, 78 games a year. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Weeks was his backup at one point. Mm -hmm. He's going through the league here. Right. Uh, in Philadelphia, Carter Hart was the golden child and Elliot was his backup. Same thing for Elliot and Vasilevsky last year. So yeah. in the <laughs> NHL, there are teams that have these massive starters. But what you don't see, those backups are always ready to go. Yep. And they are elite NHL goaltenders. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it from a surface level, it's like, he must not be that good. They are very good and incredibly good. They could start on any team. Now, when you look at it from the teams I've coached, I think the key from a team building perspective, Mike and Shelly, is that the roles are clearly defined. That if we have a goalie that's going to play a majority of the games, the backup knows you need to push him as hard as you possibly can. All right? Because you will get in there from time to time, and it can't be – Oh, I feel great today because I'm in the net. It's an all the time thing. Now, again, look, depending on the age, Shelly, you keep saying that and you're absolutely right. As coaches, it's our job to create that aura, to create that understanding of roles. All right. If I have a backup that I don't think is going to play as much as another goalie, that player needs to understand their role and how important that role is to the team. I'll equate this another way. And this is one that I don't think enough coaches do. Great goalies create better shooters. Great shooters create better goalies, Right. If you have a great goalie, that's an opportunity for your team to learn how to shoot. And it's an opportunity for them to get better. And adversely, if you have a goaltender that's struggling a little bit, your, your good shooters should be trying to help them, not sniping top right because they can. All right. That's one of those things that's underutilized in teams. All right. So I always say that too, in terms of like warmups, we're just talking about warmups, you know, warm your goalie up, but always go for the rebound if you're a skater. And I have this understanding with my goalies, you do not need to save the rebound. If you not are not in a position to do that in a warm up, all right. If if that's not activated yet, I want the skaters to know to go for the rebound because I want that muscle memory built. And there's an understanding on the goaltender. If you're warming up, hey, just make the save. Do what you're comfortable with until it's time to make the rebound save. That's up to the goaltending coach. Or that's up to the to the goalie. Right, well, Lee, and I think that's where Mike comes in too. Where his coach, his educational piece, right? That that then right, our, right. our job as coaches though, then to build drills. Where, where goalies can recover and and fight Absolutely. for the rebound because if I you're if you're saying if you're saying oh don't don't go for a rebound you you don't do this you you know it's the same thing with shooters we say it all the time if you want if you want really good shooter and peelers right. then it does have a lot of drills that you shoot and you peel off and go to the line if you want your kids like i i, right. I, remember, I remember talking to a coach right. last year she goes i can't get my girls to go to the net i don't understand i go well i just watch an hour of your practices and not one time did a girl go past the hash marks right. not one in any drill 
because right. you're telling them to get back in the line to get the drill going. I'm like, well, what do you, so, you know, and Mike brought the point up about coaching. If you want somebody to be really good at being bad, then do it for 25 weeks of teaching the wrong thing. Right. And, and they're going to be really good at it, but it's, it's a horrible habit, right? right. So I think well, this is where communication thing. comes in, right? This right. is where, where I, and, and yeah. education, right? I think it's it comes down to, yeah. it's great that I have a goalie. Like I, I remember we had our, one of my goalies in college, you know, I, I'd have to tell him, I'm like, listen, my practice, I, I said, I, I got to get you out of the net here on these drills because the kid, they couldn't, they couldn't score on them. So the kids are like, I can't, you know, the kids feel like they're the worst players in the world. Cause they're like, this kid will not stop competing. Like he will not allow a puck in the net. And I'm like, I got very fragile kids over here. They need to score. They need to, they need to see that the puck got, got past something. So, you know, it's the same thing. It's just knowing your personnel, knowing your goaltenders, knowing right. who fits in where communication, obviously in education, uh, but it, it really comes down to, you know, when you, when those, when those goaltenders and your coaching staff are all part of the team right. and you can have these conversations and figure these things out. I, I think a key word there, Mike, is the word knowing. And, and, and listen, I, again, Mike, Shelly and I were just part of this, this training camp. Right. And we talked about consciousness enough of it. You got to know, you got to kind of be conscious to these things and then you can start to implement things. And most likely you're not going to be great at first and that's okay. Right. But, you know, Charlie, I want to turn this conversation kind of based on this too, a little bit, because I think there's a mental aspect to goaltending, a mental fitness aspect. And you started the whole episode with it. It is the only job that when you don't do it great, a red light goes on. And at the top level, 20,000 people boo you every time. Right. And then you maybe make a great save, which means you were most likely out of position in the first place, which nobody seems to understand. Right. And you got to do that. So talk to me about mental fortitude in this position. How do you construct that? There is a total stigma that the goaltending uh, or goaltenders are the weird ones on the team. We talked to Mike McKenna, who's played goaltender everywhere, right? And he said that you know, that's a BS stigma. Like, uh, and he said kids actually buy into it in the position. Like, oh, I got to be the weird kid on the team. Well, he's weird. He is weird. He, no, I'm he's, kidding. I'm well, joking. Yeah. I'm just joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I hope he's listening. <laughs> but I want to I want to talk about that, like the mental fitness, because I think there is just to turn it positive, like you said, there's a massive opportunity in that position to teach life skills. You know, we always say create better people who create better players. Goaltenders have to be the most, the most intestinal fortitude of any other player on the team. Right. So how do you go about developing that advice for parents, so forth and so on? So no matter what I, as a coach do, and I'm going to start with the younger groups and I'll work it way up because it's just easier. The car ride home will kill anything that I try and do with a goaltender. <laughs> The, the car ride home will kill anything I try to do with a goaltender. If you've spent, you know, your 45 minute, 50 minute, hour and 15 minutes with this kid, if it's a practice or a game, and you've tried working with them and talking to them and say, say they gave up the game winner, whatever. And you're like, Hey, was it, you know, yeah, you probably could have had the save, but you know, they had to go through five other players to get to you. And, you know, it's a team game and everything else. And then little Susie or little Tommy gets in the car and mom and dad just tells them everything they did wrong right? or how they could have done something better. It doesn't matter what I said, what I showed them, anything like that. They've just crushed that kid. And that scar is going to last a long time. Or the other way, right, Mike? Then the yeah. parents are like, your team sucks in front of you. They can't <laughs> yeah. play. The yeah. D stink. The coach doesn't know what he's doing. 100%. So, you know, don't worry about it. It's Look, not your fault. I, I want to say this too, to, to support you on this. Okay. Um, yesterday, my son had uh, a great game, great assist, phenomenal assist. He played two periods phenomenally, and I'm hoping he's not going to listen to this till he's like 27. <laughs> but, but he took the third period kind of off from from an effort standpoint. He's eight. Parents, it took every ounce of my being to not bring that up in the car. And I only knew not to do that because of this show, right? And, and I didn't bring it up, and, I, and I'm happy I didn't because I, I said, hey, that was a fantastic assist. You know what he started doing? I really love playing today. I just had a great time out there today. And I said, wow, I could have crushed all that by just saying, you know, you should have tried a little harder in the third. All right. So I, I'm just supporting what you're saying, Shelly, because it, and, and how hard this is for us as parents. It was really hard for me not to say that. I host a right. podcast. I talk a lot. Right. The shut up is an, is, is an unbelievable thing for me. But go, go ahead, Shelly. I just wanted to say that for the parents to support you. It's no. not easy. No, a hundred percent. And, and, you know, parents nowadays, a lot different than, you know, our parents, when we grew up, it's, you know, we want to fix everything. You know, right. we want to make sure our kids got what they need. And that's a great and, point. And, and it's like, Hey, right. you know, we're, this is, you know, it's our job to make sure they're safe. Well, sometimes they have to fail in order to be able to succeed later. So, and if the kid really, really, really wants to do it, 
they'll bring it up. And if they really have questions, they probably know what they did wrong if they're yeah. the ones who did something wrong. And if they bring it up later to you, you know, and they, you want to talk about it, then that's up them opening the door. And by all means, if they've asked for your input, then give it to them. But, you know, still try and do it in a, in a kind of nurturing way, not just tell them, Hey, yeah, you're never putting pads on again. I wasted all my money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you you blew it for me. You blew yeah, it yourself. Yeah, yeah. I was going right. to live vicariously for you, and now it's done. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah but, and go ahead. No, no. So I was just going to go. And, so, you know, there's a lot to it, and the off ice with the mental stuff is sometimes more more important than you know the on ice. It's like um, I forget the exact goalie who said it, but I think it was like Bernie Perrant. It's like uh, goaltending is 90 percent mental, and the yeah. rest, the other ten percent, is in your brain. Right. So you know, yeah, it's <laughs> it, right. so, yeah, it, it's one of those things where it's like they have to train. So I, I like to use my son as an, an analogy as a lot of things, and both both my kids are, you know, every parent thinks their kids are great, you know. Right. Um, but my son's been through um, mental skills trainings. You know, he's seen sports psychologists, um, and he's he's you know, Pete Fry is a phenomenal goalie guy. Um, the goalie mindset it, I've so been through training with him. It's like, whatever you can do because there's so much of a stigma and so much pressure that are put on these kids, especially if they're confident, like if they're good, like they're going to get a lot of pressure. They're going to get, I mean, my son was 15 years old playing junior hockey, you know, as a goaltender and play, you know, since tier three hockey, but he's playing literally against 20 year olds as a 15 year old. You know, he's, th there's a lot of pressure on someone right. like that. If your player is good enough, they're going to get it. They have to have a resource to be able to get out and they have to be able to park things. Like a goalie has to have it as quick as that, uh, the clock goes or the, the, uh, light goes on and shuts right. off. That's like their mindset has to be, yeah, I got scored on. Okay. Next puck. Yeah. You know, it, the, the, the drills, like you're saying battle on rebounds. All right. Yeah. They should be able to battle on rebounds. And I'm going to get to a story real fast before it, but, um, and it's an NHL based one, but it's, um, you know, they should be able to fight through those rebounds if they know that's what they're doing. Right. If, if they're, if the drill's set up where they're just going to get shot after shot after shot, they're not going to be able to compete on it. And then when they get beaten a game on a rebound, you as a coach can't sit back and yell at that kid because you didn't give them the opportunity to practice. That's that. awesome point. Yeah. So um, it's not my story, but I, I, I was one of Mitch Korn's mentees. So I got, got to spend, you know, some time with him. And uh, he tells a story about Dominic Hasek and Max Finneganoff when they were with the Sabres. And Dominic Hasek was one of the most competitive goalies on the planet. Right. Hated being scored on. Didn't matter if it was a game. Didn't matter if it was practice. Didn't matter if he was playing cards. It didn't matter. He was just hyper competitive. So they would run drills. Well, the one in this drill, they're in the, uh, taking shots from the front. Well, Matt, like to your point, Matt, Max would want – could never score on him so he waited till dominic turned his back and then tried to fire a puck from the corner he stuck his stick out blocked it with his paddle looked at him and just shook his finger at him <laughs> that's fantastic that, yeah so it, it, that's yeah. the competitive nature and it kind of goes that's back to awesome. the other point is what would i rather see i, I want i can't teach compete i can right. drive you towards a desired goal but if you are not a competitive person it does not matter what i do with you you're not going to compete on that puck. You're not going to battle on that puck. But if, so, you're, it, if, if you can, but I can teach you skill sets. It's kind of like, you know, I come it's from anything, a, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. This, this is, this goes beyond goaltending, what yeah. you're saying right now. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, you know, I, I played D1 football. So that was my, that, you know, I, I played Division one football and, you know, I was undersized lineman. No coach really is going to look at a guy and go, hey, you know, you're, I can't get, make you bigger. I can't, I, you know, I, I can't do all this, but can, Pete like crazy and the sky's the limit for you you're going to figure out ways to make saves and if you looked at dominic hashik play even when he was in the transition hybrid time he just flopped around but somehow he'd be on his back and make always save. make the save yeah, yeah. and i do want to let our younger ridiculous. audience know the sabers were once a very good team in the nhl they were in they the will be again. conference they will be yeah they will be <laughs> right now they're in hell but uh yeah. they're, they're going the right direction benelli go ahead decade buddy. of purgatory <laughs> yeah, no, no. I was just going to say, like, that's one of the actually that's one of the pieces of the evaluation tools that I really depend on from goaltending coaches and goaltending, you know, developers. Right. Is when you're doing a tryout or you're scouting a kid and you're like, well, listen, I, I, I can see he's good. He's, he's playing at a good level. He's a good triple A goalie. But will he compete? Like, will he make my players in practice crazy? because of his competition level. That's what I want. I, right. I, I can find a lot of good goaltenders. I'll find guys that can stop the puck, but mm -hmm. 
but I want to know, like, is he always wired to be competing? Because if he doesn't have, and that's at any athlete, like that's, that's anybody, right? If you, if you have some, unless you have these gifted, you know, it's freak show athletes that just show up and can do it and then leave and like, that's, yeah, whatever. That's I'm, just, right there. I'm just good. Like, you know, but you know, but, <laughs> but right. you don't, but you don't see how much hard, you know, in his eyes, like I'm going to be the first one, you know, out of the shower. I'm going to be the first one on the bus. I'm going to be the first one. I'm going to win this battle. I'm going to, you know, eat, eat the quickest, whatever. These guys are crazy, but that's to, at some point you want to know that. And as you watch a player develop from, you know, uh, the earliest levels and now they're getting into a competitive base format, you know, and you have 10 goaltenders in your region, you have to gravitate towards some players that really, you know, right. are going to compete, not just aren't just good. Because at some point, they've got to be, they got to overcome just being good. They uh, have to I'll, be able to have the mortal fortitude to be competitive. I want to tell you a story about a goalie named Yanis Alzins, who we won a championship with in 2015. All right. He was a fierce competitor in the net. Right. And when we were building the culture, I'm trying to merge this in. This is one of the teams I said, look, I want you going for the rebounds all the time. All right. Yanis didn't like that because he he would tell me, hey, look, I'm not warmed up yet. I can't go for those. And I said, I want them to learn how to do this. And that paid off, too, because we started leading the league in second chance opportunity goals. But what I loved about him, and this is what I'm trying to tell coaches, especially at the higher levels, he still didn't like it. And I was OK with that, because I'll tell you what, when he was activated to go for the rebounds, it was eight times harder for them to score on him because he was so mad that I was letting them do it in that warm-up period. And here's the thing. We became the best in the league at that, and he didn't give up many second-chance opportunities. Now, I'm not saying this is because I instituted that. These are all competitors. But my point is, in the culture, I communicated my expectations clearly, right? I wasn't trying to make Yanis upset, all right? I, I want them to go for the rebounds for this reason. I understand you don't like it. I'm still going to have them do that. Compete when it's time. Create the culture in the locker room of understanding from you eight up in warmups. I was don't hit your goalie in the crotch <laughs> and in the helmet. All right. Don't go for the top, right? Hit him or her in the pads or understand how to warm them up the correct way. All right. I do this in adult league and my goaltender loves me for it. Right. It's just kind of ridiculous sometimes. Shelly, I just want to keep an eye on the clock because I, I've, I've been writing a ton of notes, man. This has been a fantastic episode. There's so much insight here. Um, here's a, here's a kind of a, a question I think is really important. What should a parent say to their son or daughter as a goaltender before they go into the rink? Do your best and have fun. That's what I tell my kids all the time. Love like, it. like, I don't care what the score is. I don't care what happens else. If you've done your best and you have, you're having fun doing it, you're, you're golden. It, it, it will be fine. Like, cause if they're enjoying what they're doing, they're going to compete hard. They're going to work their butt off. You know, it, you know it, 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 and do their best. So if they've brought every, you know, we're all human. Some days we're sick. Some days we got mental anguish. Some days we're we're at the we're at the top of our game. You know what? They're in the they're in the zone. That day's going to look a lot different than their best on that low day. But as long as they've left everything out there, how can how can you be upset with that? How can you be upset with that as a coach? How can you be upset with it as a parent? How can you be upset as a player? Yeah, you you may be a little let down, but you can at least right. look at the mirror and be like, okay, you know what? There's nothing else I could have done. There, I left everything I could on the on the ice. There's I I did everything I could for my team because it's a team game, right? This isn't wrestling. This isn't swimming. We're relying upon other people. We're relying on our coaches. You know, if you're at the higher levels, you know, if, if you've got the top line for Philadelphia playing against the bottom line for Buffalo, you expect that Buffalo is going to get probably get scored on or at least give up some good, good scoring chances, you know, but if, if you as a coach screw up the, the matchups and then you've got your low line playing on your, against the top line, bad things are going to happen. So, you know, that it's all about how, how, you know, you deal with things and how they, how they handle it. And it's, Go, I always said, just go out, have fun, and do your right. best. And that's well, all you need to worry about. I appreciate you talking about the Flyers in a positive light. That yeah. That's something I haven't it's, felt in a couple yeah. of years here. Um, no, listen, that's a phenomenal answer. And it just reinforces the point we talk about, you know, about creating better people and, and you know, what type of person. Because, look, the road ends for all of us in the game. All roads lead to adult league. And that it's who you are. And this game can teach so much about being a good person, especially the position of goaltending where, man, you have to deal with adversity every single second and nobody cares about you till the game ends, right? It's it's one of those things that, that you know, that's that's the kind of holistic approach to it. But 
Um, I'm not ending this yet, but so many lessons here, coaches and parents, about how to incorporate goalies into the team. I think the, the biggest one is just incorporate them, right, and communicate. You know, again, another thing that I like to do, Shelly, is enable my goaltender to the team. So if I'm doing off-ice drills with the team or I'm doing classroom work with the team, I kind of want to know who the goaltender is, not to stick them out, but in a way of we need to support this person because he or she is going to support you, right? And we're all in this together. That goalie has a bad game that goalie has a bad game. We need to do what we need to do. What what are we not doing on the ice as skaters to support the goalie? Um, or adversely, I would say to a player, player goes, I'm tired. Well, what can you do? Or I can't shoot today. What can you do? Don't focus on what you can't do. Focus on what you can do. Um, you know, so a, a lot of stuff there. Uh, listen, last question for me, then Mike, I, if you have questions, I, I've always had to ask, I've always wanted to ask this, okay? This is kind of a little bit of a, a quirky question, but I'm actually seriously asking. Uh, the goalies who have the crazy blinks, right? Hasek was one of them. You know, the, the wide opens with their eyes. Wah did that all the time. Is there any reason behind that? Or have just so many pucks been shot at their head that you think they're just kind of twitchy like that? I have to know. <laughs> so we can get really in depth into medical stuff if you want, as far as the <laughs> eyes go. Um, right. But so, I mean, just to get it, like, if you're the, the way the, the eye works is you have cones and rods in their selection of uh, how the light actually penetrates the eye. So if you're talking like, let, let's use Connor Hellebuck's video that was on YouTube, where he's just sitting on the sidelines and his eyes are going like this, like crazy. Right. That's a little bit exaggerated and Holpe would be the same way and stuff like that. Um, but they're trying to open up their eyes as wide as they possibly can. So the eye socket, so it allows the most amount of light. So big thing. So Mike, you brought this up earlier about your practices and goalies being warmed up. How many rinks are you go into that have the exact same set, set up as far as lights go? Yeah. Nowadays, how many have LED? How many have incandescent? How many have old floodlights, right? You go into a really old barn that's like right. town owned and it might have like five or six lights hanging from the ceiling that look like they literally were in the barn. Yeah, when they it was they actually make a thing on the ice. You yeah, can see the yeah, circles on, the, halo ice. on yeah. the ice. Yeah. All that affects the goalie and how they see the puck. Right. So one of the things is like getting the goaltender into the arena as soon as possible before the game, hour, hour and a half, because your eyes take 30 to 45 minutes to adjust to the lighting. Wow. So if you've got a dim set light air, lit area, right. And then like, the external and the center of the ice is brighter. You want that goalie sitting on the bench so that they can actually adjust to that lighting. But a the second they walk off and go to the locker room, their eyes automatically start readjusting to the new focus. Yeah. So it, it's, it's a very, it's, it, it's, it's really, it's, it's medically backed. It's not just like, Oh, they're just weird. It's like, it's <laughs> allowing them to see the puck right. better. So if they can't, the, the number one thing, any goaltender, if the head is moving, the eyes can't focus. If the eyes can't focus, they can't see the puck. If you can't see the puck, you can't make the save. Pretty simple. Man, I'll be honest with you. I was not expecting that in depth of an answer, and that was yeah. a fantastic answer. Yeah. So it, it, it's it all starts from the head. I teach all my goalies. It's like skating. Most we talk to some guys. Well, I teach skating they, you know, how they're out on their heads. Well, how's your head? Is your head off to the side? Well, then your whole body's going off to the side, and so are, so are your feet. It's all the alignment from the head down. It's the wow. same thing with goaltending. Those you you have to set you have to have the head steady so the eyes are not moving. They can see the puck in the biggest area. The wider the eyes the eyes are, the higher the lids are. The more light that's coming in, the better they can see what's going on. And you know, at the highest levels, like you know, when you're you're over playing in the the London Elite Leagues and stuff like that, those goalies are doing multiple scans in in tens of seconds as to where players are, where everything is. Like I'm not reading just where the puck is. I need to know where F2 is. I need right. to know where F3 is. I don't know where D1 or D2 are. If I don't know those positions, who's my threat? You know, just because the guy's got the puck. Well, if he's on his offside, on his backhand, he's probably not a threat. But the right. guy driving down the middle lane, if I haven't picked him up because my eyes were too closed, guess what? That puck's in the back of the net before I could push across laterally. So you just did a, a Dennis Rodman in the last dance version of how he looks at rebounds. <laughs> for those of you who have seen that, well, that was a phenomenal a great answer. Movie, a great yeah. documentary. Yeah. For, for those of you Bill Nye Science Guy fans, now you know that was yeah. unbelievable. Uh, Benelli, I'm going to throw it to you for any final questions. I'll tell you this too, Mike. We're going to have to have you back. We might have to start doing some goaltending episodes <laughs> just to, just to have a regular it. once a month thing. Yeah. Go, go yeah. ahead, Mike. Yeah. No, no. This is great. Like, like these, these are, I think, just out of the pure side of, you know, Co goalie competency there's there's some great content here but i think just the other understanding that 
you know, from a coaching perspective. I mean, it's easy from a parent perspective. If you're a parent of a goaltender, you just assume or you should assume that the coach is supporting you just like any other player. But our job now from the coaching education side is to try to teach these coaches how to incorporate that player into right. the, into the realm. And I think we, as parents, we all just join teams saying, well, I don't know. I just assume that the coach probably knows everything about stick handling and face offs and goaltending and power play. But you know, a lot of us don't right? a lot. A lot of coaches get into it uh, for various different reasons and have different specialties. So I think, you know, that, 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 that word keeps creeping up again. And, and Mike's brought it up a couple of times. It's just communicate, communicate with your coach, communicate with your player, get to know, your goaltender, no more, no less than, you know, the other teammates. But the, the, there is a fact that goaltenders are a unique position in the scheme of things. You could take a defenseman and make him a forward and a forward and put him on D and put a winger on the other wing. And But goaltenders are on an island by themselves, and we should recognize that, but also understand that there are pieces of training that need to be, um, you know, catered to them. And then to, and just to make sure you, you know, get guys like Mike that are teaching these, these young players, uh, you know, almost right. Mike, you probably teach your kids how to communicate with the coaches as well. They can't just be like, this is, this is what I'm saying. I don't even know who your coach is. So we got to communicate with him too, because we can't have nine different messages here, you know, going into how, what we're teaching. And, and this isn't a knock on the coaches or anything, but one of the things I'll say to my kids in my camps when I'll have like 30 some goalies in there or whatever it's I'll tell them, I say, listen, you guys ha have probably more knowledge base on this position than some of your coaches. And you need to be able to talk to them and, and, and communicate to them and say, Hey coach, you know, I, call, I, I want you to come help me out. Can we work on this? Right. This, 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 this I've worked, you know, so a lot of, a lot of these guys, you know, and I, I haven't, but is you have guys now who you didn't have 15 or 20 years ago where they have goalie coaches. It used to be like, you know, a lot of these form, these pros, NHL guys, they didn't have goalie coaches until they were like in the AHL. And even then the, the goalie coach was responsible for the development for four different leagues. So they're seeing them maybe once or twice a week. Now, you know, I'll, I've been seeing kids for years that come and see me and I'm like, okay, you know, let's, let's look at this holistically and everything else. Don't, you know, I, yeah, I'll, you can pay me and I'll work with you, but there's probably a bigger thing that we need to work, look at too. Um, so, you know, it, the kids can't be afraid. That's the two way communication is the coach needs to be open to yeah. listening to the kids and accepting that they may not understand. And this 10 year old might have a pretty good idea of what they know because they spend their parents spend X number of dollars a week paying for private instruction. And then they go practice with their team where their that coach is kind of like, Oh, well, we're just shooting pucks. It's like, well, the kid, I talked to my goalie coach and he said, I should be doing this or that. Right. And then, so if the coach is willing to listen to that, then that, it's only going to make the team better. It makes the kid better. And then you don't have that kid, like back to our original point, getting bumped from team to team to team because right. there's no home because you can't stop the puck. Yeah. Mike, I appreciate you bookending that for us. Yeah. That was nice. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, Air Force too. I, I, yeah, they, yeah. I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. As a coach, I would love it if my goaltenders came up to me and say, hey, I want to work on X, Y, Z. Uh, I want to enable my goaltenders and obviously want them to be the best they can be. So, so some quick takeaways today, you know, uh, obviously we talked about, about the mental, the physical um, incorporating goalies into, into a team environment. Um, I always encourage players um, kind of at the teenage age up goal to goalie clinics, go learn the position, even if you're not playing, right. Just understand how goalies think. I still say this to this day. One of the best things I ever did for myself was start to learn how goalies play and think I became a way better scorer. Once I understood how goalies think that's a, a quick tip for kids and coaches, maybe once a week have a goaltending practice where there's some drills that they want to work on, ask them or at any age group, right? Look at that USA hockey mobile app, find ways to incorporate them more than just the 10% or the, as Mike said, Hey, just stop the puck or make the save right? It's got to be more than that. And I think we can do a better job as a community. So uh, with that said, look, wow, this was a fantastic episode. Uh, we might have to start a, our kids play goalie show after <laughs> this one. Um, for those of you listening, obviously tag the goaltenders on your team, tag the parents on your team who have the kids in the net, uh, share it on your team snap. Um, and as always, look, you can email us. If you want to hear more from coach Shelley or more on this topic, email us at team at our kids play hockey.com. 
Um, we get a lot of emails each week now and they're stacking up, but this is a lot of ways we get episode ideas because we want to know what you want to talk about. Um, even though I can talk till I'm blue in the face, we, we want to hear from you more than me. But uh, before I do the final close, uh, Coach Mike, thank you so much for being here today. This was fantastic. You gave a lot of insight. Like I think you said it, we could talk for hours on this. Uh, we're just scratching the surface, but thank you for being here. Thank you. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. For Mike Benelli and Mike Shelley, I'm Lee Elias. Thank you so much for listening. Again, all the episodes can be heard on OurKidsPlayHockey.com or the podcast platform of your choice. It's all there. Make sure to share. Make sure to like. Give us those reviews. You guys are the best. Have a wonderful week and skate on. See you next time on Our Kids Play Hockey. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Make sure to like and subscribe right now if you found value wherever you're listening, whether it's a podcast network, a social media network, or our website, ourkidsplayhockey.com. Also, make sure to check out our children's book, When Hockey Stops, at whenhockeystops.com. It's a book that helps children deal with adversity in the game and in life. We're very proud of it. But thanks so much for listening to this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey, and we'll see you on the next episode.